do today was present three different ways to do it. Everybody, um, we all want to do spay and neuter, so how do you accomplish it? And there's, you know, the big uh, spay and neuter clinics, um, which is Dr. Adams, he has a spay and neuter clinic in Grand Rapids that does about 11,000 a year. Um, so that's kind of the dream. Um, then we have uh, Valerie that set up a transport system to a spay neuter clinic, so you don't have to have a big spay neuter clinic. Um, you can actually just transport to other spay neuter um, clinics, which are they're in Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, um, Lansing, um, Ann Arbor, and Warren. So there's a lot of them out there. And then Dr. Anderson is very impressive. She got a grant from the state of Michigan to start a spay neuter clinic in the shelter for shelter animals. So it's, it's you know, so important to um, spay neuter prior to adoption. So I thought it was a good viewpoint for me, three different ways to approach it. Um, so what? We'll uh, Dr. Thank you. I put together a quick PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Maria Ilopolo, Dr. Ilopolo. Everybody should get to know her right here. She's a wonderful lady and a great resource, and I'm plugging her. Um, I am at the Jackson County Animal Shelter. I want to give you a little bit of a history about how all of this came about. Whoops. Okay, so how did we start? How did this all come about? As Amber said, there was a grant. Uh, that grant actually did come from the state of Michigan. The grant was written by our director, Steve Hall. This would not have happened without Steve Hall. Steve Hall was new as the um, animal shelter director um, in 2009. He came on board. 2009, 2008, right, right as, as the year was um, changing over. He was the director of community health. They changed the way that the animal control was organized. They took the shelter out of the sheriff's office and put it into community health. He came in with no animal experience, so he came in with no bodies, and that was wonderful. Okay. And to boot, he's a terribly nice person. You know, that sounds like an oxymoron. So, anyway, so, in result, uh, it, or because of a result of him coming in, shortly after that, a task force was formed to, to look at is there a, an option to mandatorily spay and neuter all these animals? We have a significant animal problem within the county. Most counties do. The problem depends on the size of the county and the demographics, obviously. Um, what were our options? Our options were to privatize through contracts, uh, privatize out through veterinary, veterinary facilities through contacts, contracts. Uh, there was some talk of even you know, privatizing the shelter into one of the humane societies. Um, and then there was the option to establish a state in facility on our site. Um, and there was a lot of discussion. I came in sort of in the middle of this, and I'll explain the genesis of that in a moment. Um, this discussion with us was already going on when I became a part of it and ultimately joined into the, the discussion process. Uh, early in 2010, the state clinic was approved in Jackson County on site. Uh, what happened was we were charging, we had a $25 redemption that, that you got back if you had your animals spayed and neutered. Nobody got the money back. There was $84,000 sitting in a till. Yes. So that money has been used in part along with the grant to make this surgical suite and um, to help offset the initial cost so that we could justify it because there was no money elsewhere. So in, uh, the, in, say, in May of 2010, that should say construction on the suite, and that's within the existing facility was started. And I can tell you that our cost, we had three different bids. We ended up paying for our nice little, very compact, very small, but very efficient little facility, $37,000 was for the build out. Not bad, really not bad to put it all in, okay? And then our cost for our equipment was very cute. Um, we did, you know, we certainly spent, um, I would say maybe ten thousand dollars. So it wasn't bad. The cages, we kind of rolled in. We were creative. That came from the budget from the general um, animal shelter. Okay. 
Um, we stayed our first case July 7th, 2010. That was a red band of paper. It was very exciting. Okay, so let me tell you about our staff. We have one full-time veterinary technician. You notice she's first on the list? Do you know why? You betcha. I am no fool. I'm a doctor. I can't do anything without that woman. And she keeps the whole shelter organized from a medical standpoint. She keeps me organized, which my friend Sandy will tell you is a chart in and of itself. And she is the guy behind. Without that woman and that positive attitude, we would not be doing what we're doing. She's critical. Um, there's myself. There's our shelter director, Steve Hall. He should have flashing like, signs around this name because he is such a doll. And our shelter clerk, Betty Druin, I have everybody's names up here. We're a small group. They're all critical players. I love every one of these people. They work hard. Deb Druin gets a lot of animals out of that shelter. We laugh. We have a charger within our, our, our facility that's, we want them out the front door and not the back. Okay. We had um, we have an open door policy for volunteers, and we had a, a group of kids in, and the one kid wanted to have a fundraiser that made a T-shirt that said out the front door, not the back. We didn't think that was the best way to promote the shelter. <laughs> and then our animal caretakers, Marie Rowley, Karen Smith, and William Young. So what I want to do is introduce you to, to some numbers. Um, I'm obviously a crazy woman because I do this job. So let me tell you why I do this, this job, this passion. Here are the numbers, you guys know it. The numbers admitted into the shelter in 2009, 2010 numbers will be published March 31st for dogs, 94,000, okay? Of the 94,000, about 36,000 got out through adoption, about 1750 got out going back to their owner, 4,700 were transferred, and 32,000 were euthanized, 35%. Look at the cats, we all know this number, it's the one that makes you kind of catch your breath, uh, almost 120,000, and of those only 35,000 were adopted, and about 2,500 went home with their owner, owners, 4,000 were transferred. And 70,000, almost 71,000, or about 61% were euthanized. That's staggering. What's also staggering to me is that most of my colleagues don't know these numbers. Um, here's our report, 2010. This is what goes on in our shelter. We admit about 1,800 dogs, or admitted about 1,800 dogs last year. And of those, about 440 were returned to the owner, and 406 were adopted. And of those that were euthanized, you can see this. 318 were Amstaffs or pit bulls. Recognize that there were a lot of dogs that we were calling. My favorite, and I wish I had a picture of her, was the day I went in and the staff said to me, did you see the Boston Terrier in the back? And I said, no, I walked the shelter. I didn't see the Boston Terrier. Doc, there's a Boston Terrier mix in the back. I go back and there's this pitbull. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have labeled as a Boston Terrier. I know, this Cascade here. They got Cascade Humane Society to take it up. They found a dog that they call them Boston Terrier. <laughs> <laughs> they were creative. <laughs> so, what did we receive in cats? We received about 2,700 cats. 29 were returned to owners. Woohoo! Um, 677 were adopted and we could die 1700. I want to solve the cat problem. So here's my story. That's part of my crew. But, um, that's a rescue dog. He came in on able to walk in grade four color luxation and weighed pound. And we paid about $2,000 to get his legs fixed. That's Precious. Precious is a foster dog who's now a permanent because uh, the first foster home she went into, she peed on the ladies, the ladies' table. And then the second home she went into, uh, she didn't like to hold in signal for another. And really didn't like it. So here's my story. Sandy Clark, stand up. Here I am. <laughs> She's my partner in crime. She's the reason I'm doing this. 
October of 2008, we went to the No More Homeless Pets Conference, hosted by Best Friends. If you haven't been there, go. It's life changing. Okay. Um, in April of 2009, Sandy and I have a long history of doing rescue work together. Sandy said, I live in Jackson County. I want you to meet the girls in Jackson County. Okay. So we went there. And um, I met them. I looked around and I went, holy cow. I had no idea this was what a shelter was about. And um, so I began to volunteer weekly. And what I did is I had my little handy dandy fishing tackle box and I'd show up with my ketamine and my torb and my dex dormitory and I had new cats. <laughs> you can do it. So, so, um, and then beyond that point, it turned out I had no idea when I started this that I was going to become the shelter medicine veterinarian. Um, so, why did we do this? We interpreted the best friend's message for rescue, our interpretation, mine and Sandy's. Make a relationship with the shelter in your state. Make a relationship with the shelter that's doing things right. Pull animals from that state and that shelter. Do not take dogs from other states. Be like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. Search for the answers in your own backyard. We had a great advantage, I'm a vet, so, and they wanted to do things right, so I could come in and say, can I help you? And they went, gee, so he's, well, you bet, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you, you know? So how does our, our medical program work? You know, I'm kind of jumping here because I've got a short amount of time. My technician is there 40 hours a week, and I'm scheduled, scheduled for 10, okay? Um, we stay in neuter two different days a week, and we average so, uh, eight, eight to 12 surgeries a day. That's usually in the three to four hour window, because I'm doing other stuff, okay? Um, animals are purchased by the public and then altered. We make sure that everybody's vaccinated and on intake, they're all dewormed. We do heartworm or leukemia tests prior to or at the time of surgery. Okay, we want to know the status. We will have a rush when we have rescue, when we have Michigan Humane coming in to do close. And when Michigan Humane is coming in, we are falling apart. And I will tell you what we're doing. We're making sure the cats are healthy. We are making sure everybody's tested. We're making sure we have a feel for what their temperament is. Because we don't want them transferred to Michigan Humane and then euthanized for a medical issue or a behavioral issue. We want to know that. We want to give them a chance out the door. Okay. And so we want to make sure their animal that we're sending out the dog has the best chance. That's our philosophy. Okay. So this is kind of what we saw going on. I have some numbers for you. Um, numbers per year were, were about where we saw them, about 1,700 to 2,000 dogs a year. Male dogs that were altered, you see where our numbers were. This is what we've done so far, okay, this year. This was where they were the year previously. Now we have a relationship with Baker Jackson. And so some of those dogs were altered there. Some of those dogs in the 2009 year were altered, were came in altered. And you see a, a similar kind of pattern when you look at um, female dogs that are altered. In 2009, there were 27. We came online um, the end of July and were really running well by then. And we did 119. And already we've done 39 this year. Okay. And Male cats, see that zero? You guys know why that zero is, right? That's because I was in there neutering cats. So there were no unaltered cats in 2009. Because, because of 2000, or 2010, even before we started that, and then obviously now. And you can see our alterations are similar. The big jump, this is where we really see it. This, this, okay? So. So we're small, we're not the high volume, but we're trying to do things right, and we're young. And we're going to keep working on it. So, what is our, our medical plan? When I, okay, I'll talk fast. No, you have like three minutes. <laughs> okay, three minutes, I can finish it up. Um, to me, this was more than just coming in and walking in, doing spay neuters and walking out. This is about population. This is about herd health. This is about, it's a work in process. Every time there's an outbreak and there are outbreaks, we go back, we reassess, we reevaluate, we do something differently. Okay? We, can, we go to continuing education. I try to educate my staff, the staff. We just had a recent outbreak. 
So, what's um, standard right now? All of the animals, except those that are pregnant and vaccinated, on intake. Obviously, we're going into kitten season. You have to make choices. And a lot of times, those choices are based on can we get that pregnant mom out to rescue and soon we won't be. All animals are scanned for microchip on intake. Um, protocols to deal with parvovirus in dogs and URIs and ringworm are adhered to. Um, the technician does daily rounds. I do daily rounds with her when I'm there. Any concerns she has, even if I'm not there, she's on the phone with me. She can't, she can't diagnose and prescribe, but she can just, she can describe to me and then I can prescribe and then I can reassess when I get there. And we talk daily. So, what else goes on? We have somebody in our shelter who works tirelessly. She is a clerk. She does not make a lot of money. She is on the phone calling y'all, begging y'all. She is emailing. She is home at night doing it. She is calling me up at 10 o'clock at night saying, Doc, I got one more hour. Don't, we're not the enemy. There is an open door policy in our shelter. You're welcome to come in. You're welcome to come into my surgery site. We have tech students that come in and watch me through our program. We have kids that think they want to be veterinarians that come in. We have volunteers. We have some people that stand and look through the window and go, <laughs> like that, too. But that's okay. We have a window. You can see when you get into surgery. We just started to implement some different things to change the appearance so that we're not the shelter. We've got a we've got signs up that please says please feed the dogs. Okay, and we got a little basket of cookies. I'm proud of my staff's handing out little bags of cookies and I'm going, tell them to throw cookies to the dogs. Do you know what? You know, I learned this at the shelter medicine conference in in Ohio just a few weeks ago. You throw the cookies in the cage in the rug up front, the dog comes up front. Then when the person comes in to look at the dog, the dog's hanging out up front and they're engaged. And they're going, I had a dog likes me. No one's looking for a cookie. <laughs> you know, that's okay, he likes you. <laughs> um, for the cats, we've got a little bubble maker. We blow bubbles and the cats are up there doing this with the bubbles, you know. Um, we've got aromatherapy now. Yeah, yeah. So we have a Okay. We want to make the shelter more inviting. We want to get past that perception of we're animal control. The one little gal that's been there has been there a long time. When I first came in, she said, we are not the humane society. And guess what? She's selling dogs now. So what are the, what's the bottom line? There are shelters like ours that are doing everything they can to try to do things right. We're not doing it all right. We're not even close. It's a work in progress. I knew. I'm learning. Okay. Um, it's population medicine. There's always going to be issues. There's always going to be a ringworm cat. There's always going to be a carbon cat. There's always going to be a dog that I've tested for heartworm in March, and I get the call from the private practitioner. This dog's positive. I didn't do it. You know, I did the best I could. You know, this one I want from you guys. Please take the animals from our state. Please form a relationship with a shelter like the Jackson. Please form it with us. We got lots of animals, and we're trying. So, we look forward to seeing you all in our shelter. And I want to, do I have one minute? Can I sure. take one? This dog is the poster child for our shelter. This is Satan. <laughs> Does he look like a Satan? Okay, let me tell you the story. He's a multiple offender. He's been a dog at large multiple times. So many times that it was ordered that Satan be euthanized by the court. <clears throat> Maria, raise your hand. <laughs> this lady right here was instrumental in pushing us and tweaking the right places. This dog got a stay of execution. This dog is going to become an ambassador. This dog humps everybody's life. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> um, he is in the home with a trainer right now. I just found out yesterday this trainer is working with him because we do want him to be an ambassador's ambassador for the whole initiative. Who is a wonderful trainer. He's keeping this dog. And so that's our story, guys.
we get everybody there at least a half hour, 45 minutes ahead of time so they can do the paperwork so everything is set up. They have all the questions answered before the van gets there and we load up the van. Um, right now, uh, we've been concentrating. Last year we were very lucky to get a PetSmart grant. We did $10,000. Dollars worth of surgeries, which ended up to be about 400 low cost, low income surgeries. This year we have a Biffle grant. We've got about $2,000, and we've just about run through that. We got it at the beginning of this year, and we are pretty much gone through it um, because there's a lot of need in our area. We have a lot of animals that are not getting fixed because the people don't have money. They don't have money to pay for their houses. They just don't have money to fix their animals and that's where we need to get in, help them out. Um, so anyway, after you've contacted the clinic, you've set up your appointments, you've got your paperwork, you can take the choice of sitting down with the people at a prior date, doing the paperwork, you can do it at the, at the time of the transport. I usually get all the information ahead of time, do it at the time of the transport, just the way that brings them in that day. So that I have, I get everybody, I don't try to handle their animals. That's all about animals' job. I just make sure the animals in the cage. We label the, the carrier with either with uh, masking tape. Some people will write their name all over the carrier, whatever. But it's got to be labeled so you don't end up with four black cats and you don't know who belongs to who. That's a bad thing. Um, one of the things that I found that happens a lot is people question whether or not you believe in the clinic. Do they have licensed vets? And you've got to be able to answer those questions. Yes, I believe in the clinic. My animals went to Humane, Ohio, because that was what was available at the time. My fosters go to All About Animals. I believe in what they do. I know they do it well. And I tell these people that. I also tell them that they're not going to expect a call that day unless there's a problem with your animal. Everything is going to be okay because Amber doesn't want to have to have people call 60 people <laughs> to tell them how their cats and dogs did for the day. And people, this is their family. They want to know everybody's okay. Um, we give them their aftercare instructions when they drop off the animal. Because when they pick up, all they want is that animal and they want out of there. So make sure they get their aftercare instructions, whether you give it to them at the time they're dropping off or when they come back to pick them up. Either way, they need their aftercare instructions. When they take their carriers, make them look inside and say, that's your cat. Because you don't want anything coming back to find out that you're not got the right cat. 